Hello everyone, welcome to session three of LTech 620. This week we're going to talk about both visual literacy and visual design. So let's get started with visual literacy and how it relates to visual design within the context of teaching and learning. In last week's reading, Callow cited Bernard who defined visual culture as the enormous variety of visual two-dimensional and three-dimensional things that human beings produce and consume as part of our cultural and social lives. This particular graph from Google's Ngram Viewer shows the rise of the phrase visual culture from 1800 to 2019. And as you can see, visual culture has gone up and up steadily since the 1990s, surpassing visual literacy, visual design, and even graphic design, which has declined in recent decades. I think some of this relates to the advent of personal computing. There are so many devices with screens and there are so many ways to create, author, and share visual representations. This has resulted in a surge of thinking about the role of visual culture in our lives. Of course, Callow helped us understand that there are various approaches to analyzing and thinking about images in visual culture. Drawing on the work of Bernard, Callow argued that all analytical approaches fall on a continuum. This continuum is anchored by the structuralist tradition on one end and the hermeneutic tradition on the other. Now, some of you may be unfamiliar with these terms, but don't let the vocabulary throw you off. They're really simple ideas. And in the end, they're all about how we know what we know and where we derive meaning when we're looking at visual content. Now, on the one hand, we have the structuralist tradition. Analytical approaches from this tradition emphasize the importance of existing systems and patterns. From this perspective, individual interpretation of, say, a, of a picture doesn't really matter. Instead, what does matter is one's ability to look at a picture and situate it within cultural and social constructs. In other words, our individual unique perspectives and interpretations don't really matter that much. What is important, on the other hand, is how an artifact represents or fits into a given set of cultural or social norms. All of that is the structuralist tradition of analyzing and thinking about visual content. Now, on the other side of the continuum, we have the hermeneutic tradition. This analytical approach is all about the individual. In other words, our individual unique interpretations is really what matters as a viewer. The desires, beliefs, and values that we bring to a visual artifact is of utmost importance, and it comes first and foremost. In this tradition, meaning is made up by individuals as opposed to culture and or society. That is the hermeneutic tradition of analyzing and thinking about visual content. Stepping back, the point is that both ways of analyzing and thinking about visual content are important. We could think about the design of the piano lesson flyer, for example, from a structuralist tradition or a hermeneutic tradition. In the end, we want our learners to be able to value their own individual preferences and reactions to visual images, as well as view them through the lens of social and cultural norms. These are both skills, and they're something we want to develop in ourselves and in our students, in anyone that we work with. An individual who is visually literate should be able to draw on both traditions while recognizing their relative strengths and weaknesses. Now, at this point, Callow introduces us to his three-dimensional model of image analysis. He argues that if we really want to prepare people to live in such a visual society, that we're going to need to teach them how to analyze visual content from three different perspectives, the effective, the compositional, and the critical. Now, the effective dimension acknowledges the individual's role. It includes the sensual and immediate response an individual might have when viewing a visual artifact. This dimension also involves aesthetic appreciation, and it values creative choices when it comes to both the viewing and the creating of images. The second dimension is the compositional one. This perspective emphasizes composition, including semiotic, structural, and contextual elements. This approach understands how elements and signs are put together to create meaning. 
It also considers social situations, cultural contexts, and formal stylistic and artistic elements in order to bring out understanding of a given image. The third and final dimension is the critical dimension, and this perspective acknowledges the importance of socio-critical critique. It views all images as entirely in the realm of ideology. In other words, it supports socially just and equitable approaches to understanding visual content. For example, the critical perspective might ask who has the power to create this image, or who is represented or not represented by a particular image. That's the critical dimension. Again, stepping back, what Callow is advocating here is that we give learners opportunities to engage in all three dimensions of visual analysis. He argues that by engaging with the broader concepts of, of visuality, the possibilities of more enriched understanding of images becomes apparent. Of course, in LTEC 620, we could practice applying these three dimensions of analysis to all of the visual content we've been analyzing and creating. For example, the visual designs for the drugstore cowboy assignment or the piano lesson flyer assignment. Callow believes that by switching between these dimensions, we can offer not only multiple perspectives on images at a theoretical level, but also at a pedagogical level where educators might provide multiple pathways into positive learning experiences. Okay, let's swing the pendulum back over to the side of visual design. And we're going to do that by continuing with our conversation around principles of design. Last week, you researched layout, alignment, and hierarchy and applied them to this doozy of a flyer. So let's do a brief recap and then take a look at some of your redesigns. And your research on the layout principle, we learned that layout means the arrangement of predetermined items such as image, text, and style on a page. We also learn that layout refers to the way in which we arrange the elements of a design. And we noted that those elements actually make up the content of a design. Some of you emphasize the idea that layout establishes the overall appearance and relationships between the graphic elements in a design. And ideally, the layout of a design achieves a smooth flow of message and eye movement for maximum effectiveness or impact. Research has shown that when viewing visual artifacts, there are two common patterns in Western societies, the Z pattern and the F pattern. These patterns are largely based on a left to right, top to bottom viewing pattern. As designers, knowing these common viewing patterns can help us arrange the elements of our designs with intention. It can help us by guiding us in so that the most important information is communicated as effortlessly and efficiently as possible. We also learned about the importance of alignment. I don't think this was too new to any of you, but alignment is the placement of elements such that their edges line up along common rows or columns, or their bodies line up along a common center. Ideally, the elements in the design should be aligned with one or more other elements. Why? Because this creates a sense of unity and cohesion, which contributes to the design's overall aesthetic and perceived stability. For most designs, it's desirable to align elements into rows and columns or along a center line. And it is recommended to use left-aligned or right-aligned text to create the best alignment cues and consider justified text for more complex compositions. The last principle we researched was hierarchy. We learned that hierarchical organization is perhaps the simplest structure for visualizing and understanding complexity. Good visual design increases the visibility of the hierarchical relationship within a system. And we encounter visual hierarchies all the time. For example, in book outlines, multi-level software menus, and classification diagrams. And relating to what we learned about layout, perception of hierarchical relationships among elements is primarily a function of their relative left to right and top to bottom positions. Some common hierarchical organizations used in design are tree structures, nest structures, and stair structures. Okay, so let's take a look at critical reflection too. This was based on the need to redesign this existing flyer. 
in your analysis of the piano lesson flyer, many of you noticed its shortcomings. Melissa described the design as all over the place. Jennifer noted that the pictures don't match the information being conveyed. And Jenica pointed out that there's no unity. It is just a bunch of clip art thrown on the page. Others said the design felt very disorganized and had no flow. And perhaps Elisa had the best description when she called the flyer an excellent non-example. So how did you approach redesigning this flyer while emphasizing layout, alignment, and hierarchy? Well, several of you focused mainly on the text. In other words, you relied heavily on text to bring order to the chaos. You used text size, alignment, and placement to establish a hierarchy and clean up the design. Others of you used text and incorporated basic rectangular shapes to help chunk and organize the information more effectively. Others went beyond rectangular shapes to include curved shapes, clear angles, and other shapes to help guide the eye. Several of you saw an opportunity to combine shapes to create piano keys. These three designs all included a keyboard in a vertical layout. Others went with keyboards in a horizontal layout. Regardless of whether the keyboards were vertical or horizontal, in all of these designs, incorporating piano keys served two purposes. First, it helped indicate what the flyer was about, piano lessons, and two, and perhaps more importantly, the keyboards acted as visual cues or dividers to help separate and divide the flyer's information in meaningful ways. In other words, in the best cases, the piano keys were more than just clip art. They served a topical and a perceptual purpose in the design. A couple of your designs inverted the color such that black was the dominant background color with white text on top of it. Two designs that I think really stood out came from Elisa and Jenica. Elisa's inclusion of the curved body of a grand piano was an excellent choice. It was a strong use of shape to divide up the flyer into two halves, a white half and a black half. And she used black's text on the white background and white text on the black background to maximize contrast. The end result was a design that was eye-catching and thematically appropriate while simultaneously guiding the viewer's eye from upper left to bottom right. Now, Jenica, who is a professional designer, really took things to the next level. Her redesign flyer is fun and informative. There's a clear arrangement to the elements on the page, almost to the degree that they seem natural in their positioning. It's almost hard to imagine putting these elements in any other configuration. She also used curves, both with text and with the keyboard, to create a sense of movement as if a song was playing in the background. This particular choice reminded me of a player piano. You may also notice she used basic shapes, but purposely distorted them to mix up the design, which I think added to the sense of whimsy and intrigue captured in the flyer. Zooming out, I want to encourage all of you to study these different designs. What do you notice about them? And how might you tweak them or change them to make them your own if you had the chance? This is an excellent way to develop your critical eye regarding good design and the principles of design that we're learning about. So where are we going this week? Well, as you probably guessed, we're going to learn about the next three principles on our list, proximity, balance, and repetition. And we'll do this by redesigning another non-example. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.